Ah, there is nothing quite as relaxing as savoring a cup of warm tea, and nothing as rousing as a piping hot mug of coffee on a chilly morning. <laughs> Except perhaps drinking either of those while out at sea on an ocean liner. I do yearn for the open waters of the North Atlantic and a steaming cup of green tea once again. With the many activities and social events to do aboard Titanic, staying hydrated by leaf or bean juice was a popular pastime for passengers as well. Why don't we become Edwardian baristas for a little bit and learn how Titanic's passengers got their morning and afternoon and after dinner fixes of caffeine? Disclaimer, I shan't be discussing any of the crackery or china involved with serving tea and coffee during this video. That's an ordeal that I do not feel like getting into at the moment. It would require calling up David Kaplan, and while I miss him and his anecdotes, I simply do not have the time nor enough tea. But Titanic certainly did have enough tea. According to Titanic's cargo manifest, she had aboard for her maiden voyage 800 pounds of tea and 2,200 pounds of coffee. There were also 437 casks of tea being shipped to the United States by the Wright and Graham Company. Now, the tea and coffee intended for her passengers and crew to brew weren't neatly in little bags and ground up already. They were loose leaf tea and coffee beans, which would require proper brewing and crushing. This is excellent tea. Was it? Was it really? With thousands of tea and coffee varieties from all around the world, you could imagine the many types that would be offered for Titanic's first class passengers. Personally, I love jasmine green tea. I'm in no hurry to finish my coffee and not too interested in your opinion. However, it seems like Titanic was stocked with basic English tea. One choice for the whole ship. This tea is nothing more than hot leaf juice. Uncle, that's what all tea is. Settle down there, fireboy. And the coffee beans were also one type, imported of course to the United Kingdom. All these dry goods were kept down in bulk aft on the Orlop deck. Small amounts were distributed to each of the many pantries aboard the ship, which we'll talk about later. Now when is it time to drink some coffee or tea? If you're like me, any time is the right time. And that's the case for Titanic's passengers. In every class, coffee and tea were available for breakfast, obviously, lunch and dinner, and after dinner as well. And before lunch, tea time in the reception room or out on deck, or while enjoying the piano being played in the general room. There was always an opportunity to get a steaming coffee or a soothing warm tea aboard this ship. Even if it was late at night and you really needed that cup of tea before bed, you could ring for your steward. He would come and provide you with a lovely fresh cup, or a cup of coffee for the insomniac, I suppose. Coffee black. But the most critical time to drink a cup of anything is while being a social bunny. A polite conversation with many of your fellow passengers, some of which you might have just met, can only be done correctly during a cup of tea or coffee. When there are no breaks in the discussion for the 11 courses of food, or moments to listen to the ship's excellent orchestra playing, tea time was chit chat time. Sharing tea with a fascinating stranger is one of life's true delights. Thanks for the advice, Uncle. That brings up another excellent question. Where could one get a mug of coffee or tea? Passengers needed lots of tea. First class passengers sometimes refer to different rooms as the tea room, and on later, bigger ships, rooms would be dedicated just for tea in their service. Oh, at last, maybe I can get some of that green tea I love. It seems evident that the dining saloon would serve it, which is true, but there were dozens of places on the ship that served hot tea and coffee, and even hot milk and cocoa. Listen to me very carefully, because I'm only going to say this once. Coffee. Black. In first class, there are more places, of course. Your cabin steward could bring you a hot beverage to your stateroom day or night. You could go to the lounge, cafe Parisian, smoke room, palm court, the restaurant, the reception rooms, or if you're out on deck and the sun is setting, you're bracing against the cold breeze of the Atlantic air, simply ring for a steward. Basically, if you're in first class, find a steward call button, push it, and demand for a drink. I'd like a cup of tea when I return. Your servants too could get tea and coffee with their meals in their own dining saloon on sea deck. You would not have any beverages or food in the reading and writing room. Second class had similar choices. Warm drinks to their cabins or on deck, also in the smoke room and dining saloon, but none in the library. Third class had several selections as well. The two public spaces under the poop deck, the smoke and general rooms, allowed passengers access to warm tea and coffee. Their open space under the forward well deck, too, provided them with drinks. They would only get tea and coffee during their dining saloon during mealtimes, though. The crew also were supplied with tea and coffee, of course. How else would they wake up and keep themselves and the ship steaming ahead? Be careful of that coffee, it can stand up and walk. <laughs> All this was managed with dozens of pantries tucked away and out of sight of passengers. 
Most of these rooms had cupboards, dish racks, sinks, and hot water boilers, just enough to provide passenger cabins what they needed throughout the voyage, including coffee, tea, warm milk, and hot cocoa. Hot chocolate would require its own silver pot. I told you I don't want to get into the craziness which is White Star Silver Plate. The best tea tastes delicious whether it comes in a porcelain pot or a tin cup. But several of the larger pantries, connecting to the galleys for the main dining saloons, did a lot of the hard work. This is where the kitchen staff would first bring up the coffee beans and tea leaves from below, grind them up in the most modern devices of the day, and divvy them out appropriately to each of the smaller pantries around the ship. However, there was always room for improvement. Coffee first. Olympic's reception room turned out to be the most popular place aboard the ship, especially after dinner. Passengers loved coming here to listen to the band and drink tea and coffee after their meals. But the closest pantry to the room was all the way through the dining saloon. What a hassle it was to bring tea and coffee pots back and forth. So what the staff did on Olympic, and later Titanic, was to use the two boarding entrances as temporary pantries. Sideboards with saucers and teacups were placed here, along with hot plates to keep kettles warm on top. Fresh coffee and tea were prepared in the first class pantry aft, wheeled on a cart through the saloon and reception room, and kept warm until needed. It wasn't the best method, but it worked for the time being. When they made the reception room even more gigantic for Britannic, the plan was to give her her own reception room pantry forward by the laboratories, and Olympic would eventually have a full pantry installed in the port side boarding entrance, complete with boilers for hot water and coffee. Good, now that's all done. I can get more green tea. I hope the next time you brew yourself a cup of coffee or tea, you picture yourself in Titanic's reception room, conversing with friends, and just enjoying the voyage. Until next time, I'm Matthew DeWinkler for Titanic University and Titanic Honor and Glory.